in the previous uh, lectures we discussed about the linear dynamic analysis of structures for earthquake excitation uh, that is uh, under the earthquake excitation the structures remained within the elastic range and uh, therefore the linear analysis uh, was um, adopted that is all the what aspects of the linear analysis uh, was maintained. However, uh, the structures can undergo uh, inelastic response under earthquake excitation. The reason for this is the current design philosophy that is adopted that we will discuss shortly. Uh, but uh, the inelastic excursion of the structures during earthquake requires uh, some understanding about the inelastic dynamic behavior of structures and for that one has to perform an inelastic seismic response of structures for a given earthquake. In the previous lectures uh, we have discussed about the linear dynamic analysis of structures for specified ground motion. In that we considered both time domain and frequency domain analysis. Then we had uh, taken up the response of the structure for the earthquakes modeled as a random process that is a stationary random process. In that we performed the spectral analysis to obtain the response. After that we considered the response spectrum method of analysis which is widely popular amongst earthquake engineers because uh, it converts the problem partly to a dynamic and partly to a static problem. The dynamic problem which is involved is uh, trivial in the sense that one has to only find out the frequencies and mode shapes of the structures. Rest of the solution uh, consists of uh, a static analysis only. Also in that connection we discussed about uh, seismic coefficient method which is a purely equivalent and static analysis. For all these uh, cases the responses were uh, in the elastic range and the forces uh, that are computed or the internal forces that is computed uh, for different members they are utilized for designing the uh, structures uh, for earthquake. Now in this few lectures uh, we would be uh, discussing about the inelastic response of uh, structures, uh, why uh, this is uh, required uh, that I had mentioned before. Uh, but uh, let us uh, try to see uh, some more reasons behind uh, these inelastic response analysis of structures for earthquake. Under relatively strong earthquakes structures undergo inelastic deformation due to current seismic design philosophy. The seismic design philosophy that we have in our code that is based on three very important parameters that is the stiffness, strength and ductility. Stiffness uh, controls the response so long the structure is in the elastic range. After it yields then uh, the ductility comes into picture but when the structure yields it depends upon the yield strength of the structure and that is how the yield strength becomes an important parameter for uh, the inelastic analysis uh, of the structures for earthquake. Then after the yielding we allow the structure to deform in the inelastic range and this deformation that is the 
maximum deformation that it undergoes after the yielding that basically controls the behavior or inelastic behavior of the structure. How much deformation is allowed is uh, tentatively decided at the time of design by way uh, of some factors, but unless one performs an inelastic analysis, one cannot judge how much each member or uh, each joint at the plastic hinges undergo plastic deformation uh, beyond the uh, yield point. So, for that it is very much necessary. The seismic design philosophy uh, as such is a dual design philosophy in the codes that is uh, we assume that for the uh, design earthquake the structure will undergo uh, the inelastic excursion that is uh, the structure will have uh, plastifications at different uh, cross sections. However, uh, those plastifications or uh, inelastic deformations that takes place at the joints or in the members are within certain limit and can be easily repaired or the structures can be retrofitted. The reason for allowing the structure to go into the inelastic range uh, is uh, that we want first economy in the design. Secondly, by allowing the structure to go into the inelastic range, uh, we allow more dissipation of energy to take place in the structure as a result of that effective earthquake loading onto the structure is reduced. The other part of the seismic design is that the structure should have enormous amount of inelastic deformation or there will be a considerable amount of damages will take place in the structure under the extreme earthquake, but the st structure will not collapse. So, that is the uh, life is not threatened, life of the people are not threatened. So, uh, these are the two dual design philosophy that we have. In both we can see that we allow the structure to go into the inelastic range and therefore, we have one should understand the inelastic behavior of the structure. Secondly, the structures should have sufficient ductility to deform beyond the yield limit. So, apart from understanding the behavior of the structure in the inelastic range, we should uh, make sure that uh, the structure do have the sufficient amount of ductility and uh, uh, that ductility should be able uh, to uh, respond to the ductility demand imposed by the earthquake. So, for that also oh, we require uh, inelastic analysis to be performed. Generally, the ductility demand imposed by the earthquake is understood with the help of an inelastic analysis of a single degree freedom system and that is what we will start with. However, the nonlinear time history analysis of uh, the single degree of freedom system under earthquake is uh, not only used for understanding uh, the ductility of the material or the system, but also to understand some more important thing about the inelastic resistance of structures for earthquake. And that we understand with the help of 
the so called inelastic response spectrum. Similarly, for the multi degree of freedom system, the nonlinear analysis uh, is useful in understanding the nonlinear behavior of multi degree of freedom system under earthquakes, and therefore, the need for the nonlinear analysis or inelastic analysis of multi degree of freedom systems uh, under earthquake is also an important issue. Uh, in many cases, one if we are wanting to obtain the seismic risk of a structure, uh, then one has to go up to the collapse of the structure and therefore, a nonlinear analysis uh, may have to be uh, performed for uh, the seismic risk analysis of structures. The inastic response spectrum that is required to understand the inelastic resistance of the structures to earthquake that uh, constitutes an integral part of the inelastic response analysis of structures and uh, we will specifically look into the ductility and inelastic response spectrum of earthquake uh, subsequently while discussing uh, this uh, topic on the inelastic response analysis of structures. Now, what we mean by the nonlinear dynamic analysis over here is that if uh, the structure have nonlinear terms either in inertia or in damping or in stiffness or in any form of combination of them, then equation of motion becomes nonlinear. However, uh, the more common nonlinearities that arise are due to the stiffness nonlinearity and the damping nonlinearity. The inertia nonlinearity is hardly uh, encountered. So, here we will be mostly talking about the nonlinearities arising due to the stiffness. The stiffness nonlinearity can be uh, again of two types one is the geometric nonlinearity, other is the material nonlinearity or as the or, or what is known also as the hysteretic type. Uh, figure 6.1 shows the non hysteretic type nonlinearity. This generally arises uh, because of uh, the geometric nonlinearity. In this uh, case of non hysteretic type of nonlinearity, loading and unloading path are the same as you can see in this uh, figure. Uh, that is uh, this in this figure you can see that the loading path and the unloading path over this line they remains the same and at any uh, instant of time t during the analysis the stiffness of the system is uh, dictated by the slope of uh, this curve at a particular point. And this slope changes uh, at every instant of time t as a result of that the stiffness changes and we call the analysis to be a nonlinear analysis and it is performed using an incremental technique. The hysteretic type of nonlinearity is uh, are uh, shown in these figures. The experimental curves that we get from the, the inelastic behavior of the structure uh, during testing is of this type because of the nonlinearity, the loading and unloading paths are different and as a result of that it forms an hysteretic loop. And the area under the hysteretic loop uh, all of you know uh, is equivalent to the energy that is dissipated. The experimental curves are idealized uh, like this. The the most common idealization that is used uh, for the analysis is the elastoplastic analysis that is uh, in the beginning part it is uh, elastic till the yield point 
and once the yield takes place it becomes fully plastic that is uh, under that constant stress the displacement or the strains uh, continuously occur and then there is an unloading. So, this is uh, a bilinear uh, model in that we have an initial stiffness and then after the yield point the stiffness changes uh, that it uh, follows this uh, the curve which is the you know, top line and this has a less stiffness than on the initial stiffness. And when it undergoes uh, what unloading uh, then it, uh, uh, it undergoes a, a displacement or deformation which uh, makes a slope which is parallel to the initial stiffness or the slope which we get in the load or deformation curve at the initial stage. The more general type of uh, the strain hardening or the load deflection curve that we get is the general strain hardening curve and here we have a curve that represents uh, the load deformation behavior till it uh, undergoes unloading and at the state of unloading the slope over here that is slope of the load deformation curve is parallel to the initial slope or initial tangent to the curve. The equation of motion for nonlinear analysis is uh, done in the incremental form. Here equation 6.1 shows uh, the typical equation that we write for the solution of uh, the nonlinear problem. Here the same equation uh, that we used uh, for your linear analysis, we use uh, the same type of equation, but x, x dot and x double dot they are uh, replaced by delta x, delta x dot and delta x double dot. And C t and K t represents uh, the stiffness and the damping which changes and at the instant of time t it has a stiffness k t and uh, the c t is the damping at instant of time t. So, they are called the instantaneous values of the stiffness and the damping coefficient. And the meaning of the incremental form of analysis is that uh, during delta x uh, displacement, we assume the stiffness to remain constant during that interval and the damping also to remain constant during that interval. And the entire analysis for this interval is carried out in the same way as we obtain the analysis for the uh, linear system or in other words. Uh, during this interval a, a linear analysis is performed. The equation of uh, motion for single degree of freedom system uh, from the previous equation uh, follows like this m is the mass and c t and k t are the instantaneous values of the stiffness and damping and here we write minus m delta x double dot g that is uh, the incremental acceleration or ground acceleration that takes place within the interval uh, delta x. Uh, note that uh, delta x corresponds to uh, a time interval of delta t that is uh, uh, in the time interval of delta t a displacement of delta x takes place which is an unknown quantity to be found out. Once uh, we are able to solve uh, this equation by some numerical technique then the, the same kind of solution can be extended for multi degree uh, freedom system. However, for generating the k t and c t for multi degree freedom system uh, involves some kind of complexity uh, that we will address later. If we uh, go for the analysis in which we do not have the uh, hysteretic type of nonlinearity that is uh, we have the general uh, or geometric nonlinearity that we had shown before 
in this curve. Uh, then we can see that uh, during the interval delta x or during uh, this interval of time delta t, the stiffness changes, changes from uh, this value or the from this value to this value. Uh, therefore, uh, if we wish to obtain a reasonably good solution to the problem, then one should take an average value of the stiffness which uh, should be equal to this stiffness plus stiffness divided by 2. Since we do not know this point, uh, therefore, uh, we cannot find out this average stiffness and if we wish to include this average stiffness, then uh, one should go for an iteration, iteration in the sense that uh, we start with an initial stiffness over here, then uh, solve the problem and that will give a value of delta x and once we get the value of delta x, then we can find out this point and at this point we can find out the stiffness, then add this stiffness with the previous stiffness divided by 2 and take the average stiffness and make a solution again. That will give another value of delta x and that is how we can carry out the analysis in an iterative fashion unless we uh, get the convergence. However, for small value of delta t, this iteration may be avoided and in most of the cases, we take sufficiently small value of delta t so that the stiffness that we take at the, uh, the initial point and uh, that is uh, at time x t. Uh, with that stiffness only we calculate the value of delta x. Neumar's beta method in the incremental form uh, is used for the solution that is uh, described over here. This uh, is uh, the equation or rather the, the, these are the two cardinal equations or relationships that are used in developing the Neumar's beta method. Uh, we discussed uh, uh, these two cardinal equations when we are discussing about the Neumar's beta method of solution for the linear system. So, there the difference was that uh, these variables were x not delta x. Here it is delta x. So, we write down delta x dot to be is equal to delta t multiplied by x dot k plus delta delta t into delta x double dot. Similarly, we write down delta x to be is equal to delta t multiplied by x dot k plus delta t square into x double dot k plus beta delta t square into delta x double dot. Now, from this equation uh, 6.4, one can find out or find out delta x double dot in terms of delta x, x dot k and x double dot k. Uh, then substituting this value of delta x double dot into the first equation, one can get an expression for delta x dot and this a delta x dot is uh, again expressed in terms of delta x, x dot k and x double dot k. Since uh, x k, x dot k and x double dot k, they are known, we have to only find out delta x, then we can substitute uh, the values of delta x double dot and delta x dot to the equation of equilibrium, dynamic equation of equilibrium that is represented by 6.2 and so here delta x double dot and the delta x dot, they are now written in terms of delta x and finally, we get an expression which is uh, given over here by way of equation 6.7 which uh, is written as k bar delta x is equal to delta p. So, the entire left hand side now is written in terms of an unknown variable delta x only where k bar is given by this and in this you can see that we no CT, we know KT, 
because uh, they are the uh, instantaneous stiffness and damping at time t and m is known uh, therefore, entire k bar can be calculated and delta p uh, that consists of the incremental earthquake acceleration minus m delta x double dot g plus these terms in these terms x dot k and x double dot k they are known because at the initial uh, at time t uh, these values are already known. So, one can solve this equation to get the value of delta x and once we get the value of delta x then the it can be substituted in its equation 6.3 to obtain the values of delta x dot and uh, then delta x double dot and one can find out x k plus 1 is equal to x k plus delta x, x dot k plus 1 is equal to x dot k plus delta x dot and so on. The acceleration is generally not obtained by this uh, equation because if we obtain the acceleration by this equation and if we substitute this value of acceleration at the k plus 1 at time station that is at t plus delta t time station and look into uh, the equation of equilibrium then right hand side and the left hand side may not match and there could be some error. So, in order to remove that error what is done is that we obtain s k plus 1, we obtain x dot k plus 1 and then substitute uh, this uh, into the equation of equilibrium at k plus 1 at time station. On the right hand side the acceleration or the ground acceleration at k plus 1 at time station is known. Therefore, from the equation of motion we can get the value of x double dot k plus 1. So, that basically compensates for any error that can emerge in the uh, equilibrium equation. Now, this uh, kind of solution is valid for non-hysteretic non-linearity, but if you are going to utilize uh, these uh, type of incremental solution for hysteretic nonlinearity or hysteretic type of nonlinearity, then the solution procedure is uh, modified and it will be explained with the help of the uh, most simple type of idealization of the hysteretic type of nonlinearity that is elastoplastic system. Now, here the solution becomes uh, more involved because one has to constantly stress uh, the loading and unloading paths or in other words one has to constantly see the responses at every instant of time t in order to find out uh, whether uh, the state of the system is in the loading path or, or in the unloading path. Uh, therefore, what we do we constantly track the responses of the system at every time and step. When we uh, use the elastoplastic nonlinearity and uh, we use uh, the same incremental solution, uh, then we only concentrate in the material nonlinearity and we assume that the damping remains constant that is C t is constant at all times. However, any variation of C t uh, if desired can also be taken into consideration into the analysis. So, far as the k t is concerned in the elastoplastic assumption either the k t value will be equal to the k value which is the elastic part of the curve or k value would be 0 that is the plastic part that means the horizontal part of the the force deformation curve. So, therefore, uh, depending upon whether the state is in the elastic or in the plastic state and both in the loading and unloading conditions, uh, the k t value should be properly taken into account 
either the k t value will be equal to k or 0 and we have to uh, constantly monitor it. Now, the most crucial part of the solution is that when the state of the system uh, moves from one state to the other that is what is uh, called the state transition takes place. In that case, uh, we carry out some iteration to many minimize the unbalanced error. Now, the iteration involves typically the following steps. Say we are moving from elastic to plastic state that is uh, we have a displacement and for that particular displacement we check whether the spring force that is the force uh, spring uh, stiffness or k multiplied by the displacement that is equal to the yield limit or not. If it is not in the uh, or less than the yield limit uh, then uh, it is purely in the elastic range. Now, when we come to uh, the near the yield point, then the incremental solution in the first place may give a value of delta x which is represented by delta x 0. And we find that when we add up the value of delta x 0, with the value of the displacement at the previous time step, then at time x t plus delta t or x k plus 1 that value multiplied by the initial or stiffness or the stiffness of the system uh, that uh, product give, uh, gives a value which is more than the yield strength or the specified yield strength. Or in other words, uh, the, the solution x k plus 1 uh, that exceeds the yield point. Now, uh, in an elastoplastic system, the solution point uh, beyond the yield point does not or displacement beyond the yield point uh, does not exist. Therefore, one has to bring it down. So, in order to bring it down, what we do? We find a scaled value of delta x c and the scaled value of delta x c say is equal to a e multiplied by delta x 0. That means, the total displacement that we get uh, in the first solution that is multiplied by a factor a e. Once we multiply uh, this uh, by a factor a e to get the value of delta x c, then one can write down x k plus delta x c multiplied by the entire thing multiplied by the k value that should be equal to the yield strength or the specified yield value. Now, once we write that then from that equation one can find out the value of a e or in other words we can scale this delta x 0. Uh, by multiplying it by a factor a e such that if I add up that value of scaled delta x and add it to the value of the uh, displacement at the previous time station, uh, then the resulting displacement multiplied by the stiffness of the spring would be equal to the uh, yield limit or yield strength of the system. So, from that one can get the value of a e. Then what we do that uh, we say that delta x c is one part of the solution and the next part of the solution is obtained by is again using equation 6.7 that is the incremental solution. But in that what is done is that k t is uh, made equal to not k but is equal to 0 because we uh, say that rest of the solution will lie in the plastic zone. And the loading that will uh, be there on the right hand side will be equal to 1 minus a e into delta p because uh, the a e into delta p part of the loading corresponds to the displacement delta x e. Therefore, 
rest of the loading uh, that is uh, it in fact utilized in finding out the value of delta x p. So, in finding out the delta x p value uh, using the incremental equation what we do on the right hand side the delta p that is the incremental loading that uh, we have uh, shown here yes in this equation 6.7 the delta p is there this delta p is replaced by 1 minus e into delta p and the k t is set to 0 and from there we can get the value of delta x by solving that equation the, that delta x is called delta x p. Then finally, the value of delta x for that increment is equal to delta x c plus delta x p. So, that is how we take care of the transition state that means the transition taking from elastic to plastic state. Now, when the system moves in the plastic to plastic state, we constantly go on examining the value of the velocity. So, long as the velocity of the system is positive that means, the system still moving uh, in the one from one plastic state to other plastic state. At the point of transition uh, that is uh, when it unloads uh, then the value of the velocity becomes negative. So, near the transition point if we solve the equation or incremental equation 6.7 by setting k t is equal to 0 then we get a value of delta x, delta x dot and delta x double dot in the first instant. And that value of delta x dot if it is added to the value of the velocity x dot of the previous time station then it uh, gives a final velocity which turns out to be negative. Uh, that shows that the unloading has taken place at some point in between delta t. So, we have to trace that point. Uh, the transition uh, from the plastic uh, to elastic state uh, takes place when x dot becomes equal to 0. In order to trace the transition point, what is done is that the delta x that is obtained over the time delta t uh, that is a factor uh, so that the uh, displacement at the transition point is equal to a into delta x plus the value of the displacement at the kth time station that is x k plus a into delta x. Uh, then uh, one can obtain the velocity at the transition point as a into delta x dot plus x dot k. Since the value of the velocity at the transition point is equal to 0, then we set a into delta x dot plus x dot k to be is equal to 0. From there, we can find out the value of a as minus a uh, minus x dot k divided by delta x dot. Now, once we get the value of a, uh, then one can find out the displacement of the transition point and at the transition point the unloading takes place. So, long the transition does not take place that is up to the transition point the uh, value of the stiffness is equal to 0 and when the unloading takes place then the stiffness uh, is equal to k t or k t is equal to k. So, what we do that uh, we find out a proportion for the loading delta p over the 
uh, increment of uh, time delta t and uh, we set a into delta p as the portion of the loading that takes the system up to the transition point and then 1 minus a into delta p uh, that is the remaining load uh, on that basically uh, the trans, uh, the unloading takes place. So, therefore, uh, we write down an equation uh, with a uh, variable delta x 2 and in that we provide k t to be is equal to k and on the right hand side we write down the load as 1 minus a into delta p. The solution of the single degree freedom system with this loading and the stiffness k t is equal to k provides us a value of delta x 2. Then the total displacement at the k plus 1 at time step becomes equal to x k plus a into delta x plus delta x 2. So, uh, that is how the transition point from plastic to elastic state is taken care of. Now, the elastic to plastic, plastic to plastic and plastic to elastic these states do also occur on the negative yielding side. So, as the system unloads from the positive yielding, uh, then this unloading continues uh, till uh, we come to a transition point uh, where uh, the uh, negative yielding takes place and the system transits from elastic state to plastic state. And we take care of this transition uh, as before that is the way we have taken it in the case of the positive yielding. Then the system moves from plastic to plastic and then uh, from plastic to elastic. Uh, the transition form from plastic to elastic is again taken care of uh, the way we have taken care of uh, the uh, this transition point in the case of positive yielding. And after uh, the plastic state to elastic state uh, that transition takes place on the negative yielding side, uh, then the system uh, is uh, reloaded and it continues uh, till uh, it comes to the positive yielding side and again there is a transition from the elastic state to plastic state. Now, this kind of uh, uh, solution or the iterative solution uh, to take care of the transition point uh, many a time is avoided uh, by making the delta t sufficiently small. So, that even if we miss the transition points, uh, then also the, uh, the response that we uh, compute do not uh, become very much erroneous, uh, because the errors that are, are obtained they are of very small magnitude. Uh, therefore, many a time we uh, solve this problem by taking a smaller increment of uh, delta t value and carrying out the entire analysis. However, that requires uh, more time. Let us uh, uh, clear this concept with the help of an example. This is a single degree of freedom system and in this single degree of freedom system these uh, effects the, the force which is developed in the spring. So for that, uh, this is the curve or in other words, this is a nonlinear spring and the force deformation behavior of the curve is given by this. It has a yield point or a yield value of f x and the corresponding yield displacement. It can get unloaded at any point of time and C t is assumed to be constant. In this problem, it is given that at t is equal to 1.5 second, uh, the value of x, x dot and x double dot they are given. 
also the value of f x is given and c t is uh, given which is constant the k t that is the stiffness which is shown over here this stiffness that is uh, given. Now, with this uh, given values we see that the it is a displacement uh, and the velocity both of them are positive or in other words this is uh, the, uh, the increasing uh, portion of the displacement and uh, the f x value initial f x value is 1.354 which is less than 0.15 mg uh, mass times uh, acceleration. Therefore, the yielding has not taken place. So, what we do? We find out the value of k bar uh, keeping the value of k t is equal to k and we obtain the solution from that we get the value of delta p and corresponding value of the delta x and uh, delta x dot and we calculate delta f delta f becomes equal to k t multiplied by delta x. Now, when we add this delta f to this uh, initial value of the f x that is the value of uh, the spring force at time t then the spring force at time t plus delta t that becomes equal to 1.7243 n or the, that is greater than 0.15 mass times acceleration mass is taken as unity. So, therefore, we can see that in the, in the first time the solution that basically uh, provides a value of delta x such that the yield limit is exceeded. So, once the yield limit is exceeded then we have to bring it down and or the pull it back and therefore, we factor the displacement delta x uh, by multiplying uh, the, the value of uh, delta x by E. So, we write down f x t plus E into delta x multiplied by k t that will become uh, equal to 0 0.15 m into g. So, so that the factor that the E factor is made such that uh, the yield value is not exceeded. So, from this one can obtain the value of E and that value of E is equal to 0 0.3176. Once we get the value of E then one can find out the value of uh, 1 minus E into delta P that becomes on uh, in the right hand side and we uh, do the second part of the solution. Uh, we write down the second part of the solution as k bar into delta x t is equal to 1 minus e into delta p and in that the k t is set to 0 because uh, this part of the solution is on the horizontal portion of the load deformation curve that is in the plastic range uh, therefore, k t is set to 0 and the solution provides a value of delta x to be this and delta x dot to be this. Once we get the value of delta x and delta x dot then we write down x t plus delta t that is equal to initial value of x t. Then the first value first portion of the delta x uh, displacement that is a factor displacement and plus delta x to that we get from the sol this solution. So, this gives you the final value of the x t plus delta t. Similarly, one can find out the value of x dot t plus delta t that becomes equal to 0 0.1827. And after you have obtained the value of x t plus delta t and x dot t plus delta t or in other words x k plus 1 uh, x dot k plus 1 x k plus 1 then one can find out x double dot k plus 1 by solving the equation of motion at k plus 1 at time station. So, here we are not using any more the incremental equation, but the full equation at the k plus 1 at time station is utilized to find out the value of x dot x double dot k plus 1 and that value is 0 0.279 meter per second square it will uh, meter per second square. 
So this is again done in order to really minimize the error uh, that can come out of uh, satisfying the equilibrium equation at an instant of time t. At uh, uh, time t is equal to 1.62 second, we have this is a displacement given, this is the velocity given and uh, the uh, velocity given, this is the acceleration given and the force basically is equal to 1.4715 that is equivalent to 0.15 uh, mg. So, we see that x dot is greater than 0. So, it is increasing in the plastic state. So, k bar we calculate uh, by setting k t is equal to 0 and this is the value of k bar and delta p uh, is known we can obtain the value of delta p by knowing that uh, delta x double dot g and x dot k uh, x k etcetera. And once we get that from that we get a value of delta x. Now, uh, that particular value of delta x is uh, found to provide a value which uh, provides uh, which gives a, a value of the final velocity which becomes less than 0. So, that means a transition point has been crossed or in other words unloading from the plastic state to the elastic state has occurred. So, once uh, that has occurred then we find out a revised value of delta x 1 that is a factor value of the delta x and that value of delta x 1 is obtained as this. And then uh, by setting the value of uh, the velocity at the transition point to be equal to 0 that is uh, x dot t plus delta x dot 1 that we obtain from this factoring right. For that this plus this that is equal to 0. Uh, because at the point of transition as I told you uh, the velocity is equal to 0. So, that provides a value of E is equal to minus 6.8 and once we get the value of E then one can have the second part of the solution here k bar into delta x 2 becomes equal to 1 minus p into delta p and since this part of the solution lies in the elastic range. The, the first part of the factored part of the solution was in the plastic range. So, this part of the solution is in the elastic range and so therefore, uh, we use uh, in this equation for finding out the value of k bar, the k t is set to is equal to k and then we get a value of delta x 2 and delta x 2 uh, once we know the value of delta x 2 we can get the value of delta x 1 and plus delta x 2 or 2 b is equal to the final value of delta x. Similarly, one can get a val final value of delta x dot and uh, once you <coughs> get the values of delta x and delta x dot from there one can get the value of x t plus delta t and x dot t plus delta t. And once we know them uh, then one can find out uh, the value of uh, the x double dot t plus delta t by satisfying the equation uh, at t plus delta t time station or x, uh, at k plus 1 at time station. Also one can find out the value of the uh, force induced into the spring that will be equal to f x, f x k uh, that is at the k time station which was equal to 1.4715 and that multi plus k t into delta x 2 because uh, so long it was uh, in the transition zone the value of f x is equal to 1.4715 and uh, uh, when we add the elastic part of the force that is k t into del delta x 2 then we get the force to be equal to 1.4435 which is less than the yield stage as it would be expected. So, that is how one can carry out a, a solution. Uh, incrementally and can take care of the transition point.